Thank you so much. I'm Kathy Crane, if you all uh, got here a little late. I am here to introduce you to Dr. Robert Cunningham. He's the Assistant Dean for the Walker College of Health Professions, Director of the Occupational Therapy Program, and Professor of Occupational Therapy at Maryville University. You know, when I first started in 2020, he was teed up to do this Congress, and then we had to cancel it. He has waited, and now he's back. And, and I know that this is a talk everyone wants to hear and um, see. We will have plenty of time for questions, and I would ask him everything you want to know, okay? And I will be the one with the microphone running around. So let's hear from Dr. Cunningham, and then I'll have the mic, and you guys will run the discussion, okay? Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, Kathy and I were talking just before, and I haven't been out to do a presentation in two and a half years, and so I'm, this is really nice to be able to get out and see people. Uh, I actually did a presentation really similar to this for the Congress in 2019, so that's how long I've been kind of on hold. So uh, where's my remote? All right, so, and by the way, I am Bob, don't, don't worry about the Dr. Cunningham or any of that stuff, that's no big deal, I'm just Bob. And please do feel free to ask questions today. Uh, my job here is to kind of inform and to try to maybe possibly help some of you solve some um, problems that you're having. So um, our objectives today, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up here so I can watch, are to um, review assistive technology options to assist with computer access, mobile phone and tablet access, environmental control and communication. And if you want to talk about other stuff, uh, we can do that too. I'm fine. We can try to talk about that. But the main thing I want to do today, the big picture is to talk about settings um, that are already on the devices that you own that maybe we can change to help you access it and to talk about alternative types of things that you might use to access your computer or phone. Okay. So. I'm starting with the term assistive technology. Um, if, you're one of my, if you're a student in my class, you would know that Dr. Cunningham likes to talk with, start with definitions. And so simply the answer to assistive technology and its definition really is anything that helps you do something better. That's simply what it boils down to. The formal is any piece of equipment, a product system acquired commercially off the shelf, blah, 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 blah. But it really is literally anything that can help you do something better, more effectively uh, than you're currently doing it. So it could be a piece of foam that we put on a pen that helps you hold the pen better that costs us 36 cents. Uh, or it could be using speech recognition on your iPhone and using it to dictate messages instead of handwriting them. All right? So what types of things can assistive technology help with? Well, I've mentioned today that I'm going to talk specifically about phone access, computer access, a little bit about communication. But there are a number of things, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the categories here. So there are a number of items to assist with cooking, whether it's adapted uh, cutting boards or uh, a knife, a glove that you wear in your hand to prevent knife cuts as a term of safety, eating, alternative utensils, uh, dressing equipment. Um, some of you may be using sock aids, long-handled shoe horns, things of that nature. Uh, in the bathroom, tub chairs, shower chairs, grab bars, uh, wash mitts that you wear in your hand that don't fall off. Computer access, we'll talk a lot about today, so hold on there. Mobility, um, you're all familiar. Many, I saw quite a few folks using walkers today. Some of you may have travel wheelchairs, etc. those types of devices. And then um, communication and organizing as well. Um, communication uh, could be talking about how we might access our phone different. And for folks who have more progressed diseases, uh, um, features of the disease, maybe a device that speaks for them. And then finally, uh, technology to help us with organizing. And uh, I think things with the computer, iPads, phones, things of that nature might be useful. So let's talk about computer access. So I'm going to step away for a second. By the way, the light that shines on me that makes me look bright is, makes it also hard to see things. I almost need a visor on today. How many folks in the audience, just wait, raise your hand when you're able, how many are using a computer at least once a week?
I'm just trying to see. I'm sorry. So it sounds like this is what everybody is using a computer on a weekly basis, if not even, if not even more regular than that. OK. So when we talk about using the computer, we're talking about using a keyboard and a mouse, typically. So what I want to do today is share some alternatives that are out there that you may consider trying uh, to address these issues if you're having problems. So laptop, keyboard, laptop computers are very popular with people because they're lightweight and they're easy to carry around. But we know also that the keyboards are small, that you put them on your lap instead of up on a, on a table sometimes, and it can be harder to see them and harder to control. So one of the things we might consider is getting an alternative keyboard. Two things to consider are a larger key keyboard. Uh, I have to tell you that um, in my practice where I work with folks who have problems with computer access, the big key keyboard has been one of the number one items that I've been recommending for folks recently. The keys are approximately one inch by one inch in size. It can get that you can either get a Bluetooth wireless keyboard or you can get a wired one with a USB connection. You can order it on Amazon and they run approximately $85. But basically, this makes your targets bigger and decreases the amount of control or uh, accuracy that you have to generate to use the computer. Okay? The second one I want to talk about, I'm not as, it's not my favorite, but it works for people, and that's a key guard. And the key guard is right here. The key guard is actually either a piece of plastic or metal that fits directly over a traditional keyboard or a large one. And what it does is it forces you to drop your finger through the hole to get to the key. So the idea is to reduce those accidental keystrokes, that, that, that act of typing where you strike the letter next to it instead of the one that you wanted. The reason I say I'm not a big fan is that it tends to cover the keyboard a little bit more than I like. But for some people, this is the answer. Another nice feature of the key guard is that a person can rest their hands on it and don't have to hold their hands up so much to access the keyboard. The one thing I will tell you is that it's pretty much impossible. You don't buy a key guard separately. You buy it attached to an existing keyboard already. So you're getting both at the same time. So you can really look for one that's got smaller keys or bigger keys with the key guard attached. And the most exciting thing I can tell you is just about almost everything I'm telling you about today, you can order off of Amazon. Okay. All right, next up is the topic of speech recognition. The picture that you see up here is of a product called uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking. It's probably the most recognized speech recognition software out there for computers. It is limited to use on PC computers. So if you have a Macintosh computer, we need to talk about something else. But speech recognition uh, software does two things. It allows you to enter text to a computer through speech. And it also allows you to control features of the computer via speech. So with Dragon Naturally Speaking, you could say, Open, um, open Parkinson's file, um, and then start dictating. You could say mouse up, mouse down, do everything with your voice. What I find in most cases is that the people that do use speech recognition are primarily using it to do text entry and maybe some editing. Because a lot of times we're still able to use a mouse or a different type of mouse to do those features. Because I'll be honest with you, doing the mouse features and the controls that gets a lot more sophisticated and a little more challenging than just straight text entry. But what I am happy to report is that the software, the speech recognition software that's available today is incredibly accurate uh, and works really well. It's so much better than it was 10, 15 years ago. If you want to try something that's free before you pay $175 for this one, you have a lot of options as well. So on a Windows computer, there is um, Windows Voice Access or Speech Access. And that's built into the computer. It's, with, it's in the ease of access settings, which are the accessibility settings. And it works very well. Um, I'm actually really impressed. It's coming along. It's made a lot of improvement over time. They actually, in Microsoft, in their online version of Microsoft Office, has it built in that way. And online, I think that even works better than the one that's built into the computer. Uh, there are other ways you could try it on a computer. If you were to use Google Docs, people are familiar with that, on the web, you go to Google Docs, which is a word processor that Google provides for us for free, and they have a feature where you can do speech recognition on that as well. And I find it to be incredibly accurate. Uh, and then if you own an Apple computer, Apple has built-in speech recognition as well that allows for both text entry and for computer control. So if you wanted to go that route, you could do that. So there are a lot of options out there. 
I know that to some people, speech recognition seems, might seem a little intimidating or a little overwhelming, but what I always tell people is to start small with it. And I've worked with a number of clients who really wanted to still write with their hands, and we just found that it just wasn't working. And then we wanted to try typing, and typing just wasn't quite working. And I have found that um, with practice, speech recognition can really help folks out, especially for smaller tasks, an email, a note to somebody, things like that. Because actually the part that nobody tells you about with speech recognition, the hard part, is becoming used to talking to the computer as a way to enter information. I always tell my students it's like this. When I'm typing a paper or an email, I start typing, and I'll say, you know, dear so-and-so, no, back, 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 and I back it up and I change it, and I stop for a little bit. If you do that with your voice, all those things you say or do are going to end up in that message. And so that's a little bit of an issue. So my rule of thumb is think it, turn the microphone on, say it, turn the microphone off, think it, turn the microphone on, say it, turn the microphone off. Because that's what it takes to start becoming more comfortable with it. And the more common or routine things you do, the easier it is. Like an email to a, 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 a child, one of your children, or a friend, things like that, that are pretty automatic to you. Okay? All right. So now let's talk about some adaptations that we could possibly look at instead of alternatives. So I talked about alternative keyboards to you, talked about software as a different way of entering information, but what if you're doing pretty well with your keyboard, but you're wondering if we can just change the settings a little bit? And so the two settings we want to talk about um, are part of, in Windows, it's called, it's filter keys is what it's called. It's in the ease of access settings, okay? And filter keys has two parts, slow keys and repeat keys. And I think the one that most of you would be interested in is slow keys. And what it does, it says, the fancy thing is it disregards keystrokes that are not held down long enough. Simply it's this, if I turn slow keys on, I can adjust how long the key has to be held down before it's recognized. So if you're typing and you accidentally touch K on your way to J and slow keys is turned on, that K doesn't show up. The trade-off is that you have to become used to the fact that you have to hold that key down just a little bit longer than you're used to doing it so to make sure you get the one you want. To give you uh, an, an example, I worked with a client one time who actually had cerebral palsy and we were using an adaptive keyboard that was smooth across the top, like on your, on your iPhone. And he had to drag his finger all the way across the screen, but because we turned slow keys on, as long as he was moving and didn't stop, the key didn't register until he stopped on the key that he wanted to. And we can do that with a traditional keyboard here as well. And you can control it anywhere from 0.1 seconds, I think, up to 0.9 seconds. So you do have a lot of control over it in terms of how long that has to be. As I know, a common issue um, with folks who have Parkinson's is that accidental keystroke on their way from one key to, to the one next to the one they really wanted to hit. Repeat keys, actually, it's a little more trickier to set up, but basically, repeat keys prevents you from bouncing on that, hitting that key two times. And so it won't accept that second, in, that, that second input, right? That's what that one's for. So these are things that you can play with uh, on your computer until you finally get the setting the way you want. And again, on a Windows computer, it's an ease of access. On a Macintosh, just a show of hands, how many people are using Windows computers? Okay, thank you. And how many people are using Apple computers or Macs? Oh, Windows have got it by just a little bit. So on an Apple computer, you go into settings, and then they're called accessibility features. And then they break it down by area, and so it would be under the keyboard section. Yes, yep. The only thing you'll find is that sometimes they, they'll label them different, but they're both called slow keys. Um, Apple doesn't call it anything, doesn't use the term filter keys. I wish, I wish Microsoft wouldn't because it confuses people because filter keys isn't a thing, it's a category with these two things in it. Also recognize, everybody, is that anything you hear me say today, and I saw this, this woman up here is writing things down, if you, wonder, if you want to know how to get, get to where he said, just type Windows, slow keys, and there will be 800 articles to show you how to get there, to show you how to go ahead and change that setting and look at it. Okay. So let's talk about the mouse next. And because we use graphical interfaces, the mouse is really important to us in terms of being able to point and click on all the things we want to interact with. 
So on a computer, one of the things um, that I've found that can be really helpful to folks who have Parkinson's is to have a device that's stationary. So instead of me moving the mouse around, um, the mouse stays in place and I move some aspect of it. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna show you stationary devices like the trackball you see here. We're gonna talk about head control, eye gaze, and then an adaptation called tremor control. So um, let's start with, well, actually, I'm gonna go back one. Let's start with this guy. So this is a trackball. It's a Kensington trackball, and it's actually confusing because it's called the Kensington Expert Mouse. Why do they call it a mouse when it's a trackball? I have no idea, but they've called it that for 20 plus years, all right? The beauty of the trackball, as I said earlier, is it stays in place. It, goes, it sits on the desktop where you're at, and then you move the ball with your hand, or you move the ball with your fingers. And again, the nice part is that you're not having to move your whole arm to control the mouse. Uh, Kensington Expert Mouse goes, I think, for $75. This product has been on the market over 25 years. I have one that old and it runs great. It's a really, really solid product. I have no stock in Kensington, by the way. Okay, good, I got the crowd to laugh a little bit. I was also worried you guys just had lunch. I'm afraid people are gonna be kind of nodding off or something, so I'll keep trying to work a couple jokes in there. All right, so now let's talk about different. So down here in the bottom right-hand corner is something called the roller mouse. And what you, it's kind of hard to tell from the picture, but right here is a bar. It's a cylindrical bar, and you roll it with your hands back and forth, all right? And then on the bottom, we've got the buttons for clicking, and your hands can rest here. So you can use one or two hands and roll that bar up or down and also slide it left or right to move the, uh, um, move the cursor around. Now, full disclosure, I've not worked with a lot of clients who have Parkinson's, I've worked with a few, and in most cases, one of the things that they really liked was this guy right here. So Roller Mouse has a variety of products on the market on their website. I don't know if you can get Roller Mouse on Amazon or not, and they start in the 150, you go up to the $250 range. They really advertise themselves as being the ergonomic solution, and I, that ergonomic is one of those terms that I just kind of ignore, because if I put a big handle on something, I can call it ergonomic, and there really is no measure or standard for that. But what I have found though is because it is stationary and because I can rest my hands on it in the front and move two or one, one hand or guide one over the other, that this is a solution you might want to look at. And I'm also at the end, I'm going, to, I'm going to provide you with a couple of resources where you might be able to try these things out before you try to purchase them. Okay? Now, if we want to go somewhere completely different up here, this is called the Glass House, G-L-A-S-S House, O-U-S-E. It sounds German, but it's not. It's actually made in China. And what it is, is a head mouse. So you wear this on your head like glasses, and then the part that you see in his mouth is a switch that's got a rubber cover on it, and the person bites the switch to click. When you move your head, the mouse cursor moves. Now this is very different than what most people have, so I recognize this isn't a solution for everybody, but if you are a person who has good head control, I highly recommend this device. Because it's Bluetooth oriented, and so it is so precise. You have to learn to use your head to make movements. Now the other part is that the switch can actually be, you could actually disconnect this switch if you're not comfortable with the idea of a switch in your mouth, and you could actually have a switch or an adapted switch, sorry, which is like a little disc, and you could have that sitting next to you and you could just be clicking on that. You could even have a regular mouse connected and be clicking with it instead if you're more comfortable. So that's something very, very different. But this product is excellent. There are other types of head mice out there that are based on cameras, tracking dots or other items on your head. I wouldn't even consider going there anymore because this is so much better and less expensive. I think Glass House 2 now is 300 or 350, something like that, okay? Yeah, yes? I'm sorry? It doesn't, that's, and that's its drawback. So you, if, you, if you do wear glasses, this thing sits on top of that, and that's the negative. There are a couple of other options out there I could talk to you about, and I'm forgetting the name of them. There's one out there that begins, it's Q-U something, Q-O-W, Q-U-A-H-O, and it actually can mount on the frame of your glasses, and I understand it works pretty well too. I've just had a lot of firsthand experience with this one, okay? And then something that's really interesting, I came across a few years ago, it's called the AMA Neo. And this one actually is made in Germany. 
And what this one does is it, dam it dampens tremors. So you connect this device to your computer, and then you connect your computer mouse to it. And so if I'm using the mouse and say I have a tremor like this, it electronically takes the tremor out so that the mouse cursor isn't moving as much. I was so excited when I found out about this and I started working with the Parkinson's Association, but I didn't really have many, many people to try it out with at the time. So it is still available. I think it runs $300, $300 and there is a vendor in the United States that carries it. And if you wanted to find it, you would put in AMA Neo. This one might be harder to find to try out um, without actually purchasing it. But I like it. I don't know that it's the answer for everybody, but I find it, it does what it says it does. It's just a matter of, is it enough for certain types of tremors? And you can control it too in terms of how much tremor dampening it does. Okay. Just checking my time. Okay. So if we want to go really, really different, then the next step, and by the way, I'm kind of presenting these as a progression of least to most. And so uh, this is an example of eye gaze. So this is the Toby PCI Go. Uh, the eye gaze part is right here. You can get these to work with Windows tablets or on a Windows computer. And there are also some companies out there making eye gaze that actually work with the iPad now. You have to have an iPad Pro because of the processor speed that it needs, but they are out there. So in the case of eye gaze, what you're looking at is that this is basically a camera. You position it in front of you below the monitor and you go through a, a training session um, where you calibrate it and then it reads the, eye, the, the motion of your eyes. So if you want the cursor to go left, you look left. In the case of the Toby, the way it works is you have a menu down the right side that would have like left click, right click, click and drag, et cetera. You look at it and then you look at the thing you want to click on. This is for the person who's patient and really wants to use the computer and nothing else is working. But there are people out there that it really does work for. Um, I have an assignment. I teach a technology class uh, in the OT program at Maryville and right as we're speaking, I have an assignment where the students have to go in by themselves, here are your directions, and they have to use this and they use the glass house. And they're successful, they do it. But I just warn everybody that this is a lot of technology and a lot of technology isn't necessarily what everybody's looking for. I would also share with you that eye gaze is expensive. Um, I think, you know, two and three hundred dollars, I'll argue with you if that's expensive or not. This item runs into the thousands of dollars. So um, the eye gaze stuff is, is a little pricey. But becoming, there's getting to be more and more competition all the time and that's bringing the prices down a little bit. Okay. Okay. So what else can I do on my mouse? So remember, those are alternatives. These are some adjustments that you can make. And I think the thing that most people would benefit from is changing the tracking or the cursor speed. If you go on a Windows computer, you go to settings, you would then select the mouse, and then you can go in and you can slow down or speed up the speed of your mouse cursor. And that's actually, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to double click there, pardon me. But you can also do the cursor speed and I don't think I've got that one set up. And most people don't recognize that. So the, track, the, the cursor speed, if you set it really slow, that means you start to move the mouse, you'd have to stop, pick it up, go, pick it up, and go. If you take it the whole other way and turn the speed up really high, a little bit of movement and that mouse will shoot all the way across the screen. And in most cases for people with Parkinson's, I would think that the answer is to turn the mouse speed down just a little bit, okay? And that then means if you have a little bit of a tremor, that mouse cursor is not going to move so much. We can also adjust double click speed. That ability to go click, click is adjustable. I always tell the story about my father who, when this story happened, was 20 years ago and he was in his late 50s. So, but he said, dumb computer, stupid computer. I said, dad, why is the computer stupid? Because this click thing doesn't work. I double click on it and it just doesn't work well. Dad, let me show you. And I turned it down two notches and he could go click, click, and that was as good as going click, click. And that's basically what it amounts to. That's a really simple setting to change. On a Windows computer, go to settings, go to mouse, change the, change the double click speed or change the tracking speed. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I gaze. Yes, sir. Yes. I consider Toby to be the best, best item on the market. If, if I had to buy one for my family, that's the one I would get. And I, it's, it's good. 
but uh, they all have the same thing, though. You have to learn to use them and you have to be patient. The, the biggest issue with eye gaze is that, let's say you're just looking at your desktop and you're looking for the icon to open up whatever program, let's say you're looking to open up Microsoft Word, and you're looking and you stop and you're looking, right? Well, wherever your eyes are stopping while you're looking, the computer is selecting because the way, the way most people make choices is to hold their gaze on it for a certain period of time and then that item is selected. So that really does take some practice with people. But you can go with the switch as well so that you could just look at things and if you're able to, you could use a switch just like you could clicking the mouse button. Okay? But I do consider that the, the, the Toby is, in my, my opinion, is the standard. Toby actually, they do the thing for the computer and the and um, Windows tablets, but they probably have their product the most on communication devices that we would associate with a person who has ALS, for example, and so that's the way they would control their communication device. So they're as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. And actually, there are some. There's actually one that's free if you have the right kind of iPad. If you have an iPad Pro. There is a pro, there's, a, there's an app that you can get, and you can actually just use the built-in camera to do eye gaze and, and to do some tracking. It's not anywhere near as good as the one I just talked about, but it works. Yes, yeah, sure. As long as you're okay, it's, it's, it's your time, so. If you say it, I can repeat it. Yep. Am I familiar with Steady Mouse? I am not. Okay, that's really good to know. Do you have any? Can you tell me what it costs? Can I find it on the web? Okay. Steady Mouse is the product that the gentleman was telling me about. It basically adds more functionality to the mouse settings so you can control it more to control cursor speed, button speed, things like that. Okay, steady mouse. Thank you. And by the way, welcome to my world. You never know everything that exists, right? And so that's why we're all here. We're learning about things that are out there. I don't know about steady mouse. And I've, I'm two years of not getting to go to conferences, so I'm a little behind as well where I haven't been able to keep up with all the latest. All right, so I'm curious about mobile devices. Are, how many people, are there, raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay, good. Anybody using a regular old fashioned flip phone? Okay, I can't help you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get a smartphone. I'm sorry, I'm being a smart aleck. All right, now, are we having issues with touch and accessing the smartphone? If you're having any, any even a little bit of an issue with getting stuff, can you raise your hand? Okay, good, this is good. The last time I did an in-person one of these, I did an education session with some of my students at the Parkinson's Association. I had all this computer stuff set up. I was so excited, and then we had a little table for, mount, for phone stuff, and everybody just ran to the phone. So that's what it was like. So I didn't do the computer stuff, but it's my understanding now, I think that folks might be a little bit more interested in computer. Nonetheless, we're gonna talk about basically some of the same things that we just talked about for computer that are also available on smartphones. I'm gonna talk about iOS, Apple first, and we'll talk about Android after that. So, uh, just like there are accessibility features in Windows and in Mac OS, there are accessibility features in the iPad and the iPhone as well. And I don't have Apple stock either, I certainly wish that I did, um, but here's what I would tell you, is that the Apple iPad is simply the single most accessible device in the free world. It just is, and the iPhone is the same way. Androids are good. I'm not knocking anything else about them, and they certainly tend to be less expensive. But from a standpoint of accessibility, Apple has gone above and beyond to make their devices accessible to any type of disability that exists. And the reason I share that with you is that I want you to know that there's always something we could tweak or change on these devices to try to see if we can make them more accessible. And it's not just, I don't mean to also oversimplify it or make it sound like it's just easy, but there are things that we can try. So one of the things I want to talk about first is that sometimes just even the task of reading can be challenging for folks, all right? And I'll put this one even just because our eyes are aging and it's hard to see text. So on the Apple side, there's something called speak selection or speak screen, which is built in. 
So with speak selection, when that feature is turned on, if I touch text, let's say you're reading the, uh, let's say you're reading an article on Wikipedia, you would touch the text, highlight as much of it as you want, and then a menu bar comes up and you touch speak, and it'll read it to you, just like that. The second feature, speak screen, if I had the article up and I had this feature turned on in accessibility features, I would take two fingers, pull down on the screen, and it would start reading the whole thing right from there. I tell my students about this one all the time because I am tired of running into students who are texting on the sidewalk or reading their email and they walk into me, okay? If you, if you gotta read while you're walking, then pull two fingers down and listen to it so your head's up so you don't run into me anymore, okay? And they do it all the time, trust me, okay? Now, next one I wanna talk about uh, is other aspects related to vision. And so Apple has a feature called Zoom which allows you either through pinch, which might be challenging for some folks to do, to zoom in or out, which you're kind of all, probably already kind of familiar with, but there is a zoom feature also where you do a double tap and it'll zoom into the set, the, the amount that you've got it set on. Um, there is a product called Magnifier. How many people are familiar with Magnifier? Raise them high. Okay, so Magnifier actually might be my favorite item in the world since I've turned, gone past 50. And I'm pretty far past 50, by the way. But magnifier is a feature that basically lets you use your camera as a magnifying glass, and then you decide how much magnifi magnification you want. So take the pill bottle, hold it up, turn on magnifier, and then you can see it big on here. Um, it's almost as good as the light in a restaurant when it's dark and you can't read the menu. So you can also go to magnifier and it does it, and it's really easy to use. Yes, ma'am. Magnifier is in accessibility options as well. So on an iPhone, you go to settings, and then look down the left-hand side, and right under general, you're gonna see accessibility, okay? Now, the other thing I wanna tell you about the iPhone, and it's the best feature they've added to accessibility in six or seven years, is that they have a, um, they have a feature, so it's the accessibility home button, if you will. And so, if you have an iPhone that still has a home button, you can set up the things that you want to be your accessibility options. You can turn them on simply by doing a triple click. And you can turn them off by doing a triple click. So I could set magnifier to be accessible by doing a triple click on my home button. If you have a newer iPhone, it's done with the power button on the, up on the right hand side, you would triple click it instead. It's also great because some of the accessibility features can be hard to get out of because of how they make you operate the phone. And if you can't, you've always got your safety by going to the triple click home button to get out and get back in. And I have many stories I could tell you about how I got locked out of my own phone because I couldn't get in because accessibility features, okay? I'm not kidding. And then simply larger text, all right? Um, you can, I'm trying to think, is larger text in accessibility or is it in view? I think it's still in accessibility. And you can just go in and make all the text on your screen bigger. It's just like choosing a larger font. I think I'm up to about halfway now. It just makes it easier to see everything on the screen. Okay. So uh, the other thing I want to tell you about, and I think that some of you might find this one really interesting, is on an iPhone, there's an accessibility feature called assistive touch. And when you turn it on, oops, sorry. When you turn it on, you'll see this little button appear on your screen. And you can move this button anywhere you want on the home screen by touching it and dragging it around. But when that button shows up, if I push it, then this menu comes up. And then I could choose device. And then this menu comes up, and I could then use these buttons here to turn the sound up or down. Well, because what happens is that for many, many times I know that pushing these small buttons on the side are hard. So this eliminates the need to have to push these buttons and lets you use ones that are on the screen instead. Um, a screenshot on an Apple. Hold the power button and the home button at the same time. That's hard for a lot of people, all right? With this feature when it's on, you would just touch one button and you can get that to happen, okay? All right. Does anybody use assistive touch? Anybody know about it? Anybody interested in trying it? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I did something good today. I got one right, okay. Um, and then also just to know under touch features, you can adjust on an Apple the speed of the home button. How you can either click it slow or slower, slow or slowest. So if doing that click doesn't quite work for you, we can adjust the speed for clicking on that too. Okay. All right. And then also to point out, there are a host of touch accommodations 
that are part of accessibility, right? By the way, settings, and then, I'm sorry, I can't see it, because accessibility is already open. But it's usually, it's right underneath general. And then you can go into these touch settings, and so then we've got things like slow keys again um, that you can use, or how long do I touch before it's recognized, all of it. I'll be honest with you, these aren't for the beginner. It doesn't mean you can't be playing with them, but these, these are a little trickier to get to work, and I still struggle with getting them to work the way I want sometimes. And unfortunately, the manufacturers do not do a great job of documenting them and how to set them up as much as you can. Um, what else am I tell you about that? That's it. I would also point out to you that on an iPad, if you're using an external keyboard, you can turn on slow keys and no repeat keys on this as well. So if you prefer an external keyboard to the touch screen, we can still adjust those features on this as well. Okay. okay. And then finally, speech control. So this would be like speech recognition like we talk, talked about earlier. And on an iPad, you can actually do um, speech recognition just to enter text. But you can also control your entire iPad just like you can on the Apple with your voice. You can do everything you want in terms of opening things, editing, all that stuff can be done with voice as well. And the documentation for this is pretty good, but again, this is that next level where it's starting to become more involved, okay? Before I move on to the next thing, I would just, I would say this about speech recognition, and that is, if you think, if you're, if you're, having, if you're having a hard time with writing notes by hand, just Give this a try once or twice. And by the way, to use speech on an iPad, you have to go into keyboard settings and turn on speech control there. You go to keyboard, speech, and, and then you turn on, it's an option you turn on there because then on your screen, you'll see a little microphone next to the space bar. But I encourage you just to try a short note. Okay, I gotta keep moving, right? I'm watching my clock. Yes, yes ma'am. All right, Android, well, I'm not as good here, so I'm going to be fast. I'm, you can tell I'm kind of an Apple guy, but, I'm, but Android has most of the same thing. So if you want the text on your, um, on your Android phone to speak to you, you go to, um, you turn the speech feature on, it's in select to speak. And actually you go into settings on an Android, and then way down at the bottom, which I'm not happy about, is where accessibility is, and then these features come up and you can turn it on. Okay, it worked the same way as the Apple one. Um, I really like their keyboard. So they do have an alternative keyboard that looks just like this is what it looks like. And so we can then change the font size. Uh, we can uh, do some magnification as well as an option under vision. The vision settings on an Android are at the top. I like that because if, that might be hard to find if I have a vision problem. And then there's, as I mentioned, the high contrast keyboard. Um, their assistive touch, that button I was just telling you about on the iPhone, Theirs is called Assistant Menu. You go into the accessibility settings, you turn it on as a feature, and then when you go to use it, um, you'll see this little guy right here. And that's the same as my dot on the iPhone. And when you touch it, then you've got those same sorts of choices where you would touch the buttons instead of the side buttons and things like that. And then they have something called Voice Access, which would be the same as Siri, that you can use to do controls. And full disclosure, I have no experience with this feature on an Android device, I don't have one, and my Android pad, um, tablet doesn't have it as an option, so I can't tell you as much about that one. But I, I, I will say this, the Google, the Google speech recognition on, on um, Docs is fantastic. Okay, so some other things we might consider that don't necessarily connect to the computer. I call those performance enhancers. So a couple of things to think about are the use of a pointer of some type. In many cases, we can't, we have difficulty isolating the finger, or that becomes the problem. So uh, a typing splint like this, which runs about 30 or $40, you can find on Amazon, left or right-handed, small, medium, large, might be the thing that you need to type a little bit better. Or simply an old-fashioned stylus. Lots of places still give out pens that are a pen on one end and the stylus with the little rubber knob on the other. That can make a difference. I've got students working with a group of clients right now um, being served by Easter seals. And invariably, they all were having difficulty with the finger and the touch. They just didn't have those ex that experience. But when we gave them a stylus, it changed immediately. That really made a difference for them in terms of access. The other that I think might be interesting to try are these forearm supports that you see right here and right here. These attach to a desk just with clamps. 
So you set your arms in them so your arms are resting and then they're very, they're friction free and your arms move around and you're not wasting all that energy trying to hold your arms up. This is one I would really consider trying and you can get some stuff that's pretty inexpensive, um, like $30, $40 inexpensive and it doesn't wreck anything. You don't have to drill holes in anything or stuff like that to use them, okay? Okay, where am I at? Oh, software enhancers. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a one-fingered text texter. I can't do two thumbs, never been able to, not interested, I don't text that much. But I use one finger and I use word prediction, word completion. And so many folks don't like this feature, the young people don't like it at all, it makes them mad. But I really like it because I can do a couple of, type a couple of keys and the word I want is right there and I touch it and get it and I don't have to do all that typing. Um, also a feature is text replacement. And that's a setting that's under keyboards, I think, on an iPhone. But with text replacement, what you're doing is it's just like when you text and you say, um, um, LOL, laugh out loud. We can set it up so that when you type LOL, it actually changes it to laugh out loud. So you can create your own list of shortcuts that you want if you can remember how to do it, if you, if you can remember what your codes are. So the official fancy term is abbreviated expansion but it's just text replacement. And that can be a really nice way. So for an example, if you don't want to type out your full name as an ending to a message or stuff all the time, I could put BC, but when I type BC, it's actually going to put Bob Cunningham, comma, OT slash L, blah, 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 and do that. That's a, that's a really nice little time saver. I always tell this one to my students, they don't have to type out occupational therapy completely all the time. The only thing is, you can't use a code that's a real word because it'll always replace it. And? Okay, do you want me to stop and just take questions? Yep, so I'll talk quickly about in controlling your environment. So you can't walk around now without knowing about these guys, the Amazon Echo and the Google Home. Both are effective devices. These are smart speakers is kind of the official term for them. And they, they utilize speech recognition as a way to control them. All right, smart speakers in conjunction with the other appropriate hardware can provide you with a lot of features in terms of safety. So we could connect cameras to an Amazon show, which is the Amazon Echo with a screen on it, so that I could see who's at the front door. Um, I can use it to make phone calls. I can use it to set alarms. Alexa, remind me to take my pills at three o'clock and you can set multiple alarms on them. To-do lists, Alexa, um, today I want to paint the house, buy dog food and whatever. And then she'll remind you that those are the things on your list when you ask her about it later. Um, you can get, you can get Google, Google Calendar integration with it, so you can say, Alexa, what's on my calendar today? And she'll read it to you. Uh, and you can control lights, thermostats, things like that. So um, the thing about the controlling other stuff is that you buy those products and they're almost all compatible with the Alexa or the Google Home, but they usually in, they come with their own apps. So you put the app on your phone, you set up those lights or those sockets, and then when you go into your um, Alexa app, you then make the connections with them there and you can do it. So I'll give you an example. My mother-in-law has some mobility issues. So she's got an iPad, she's got three Google, not three Google, excuse me, three Amazon dots in her house, one on each end and one in the middle, and I have six or seven lamps set up for her. And so she can say, living room lamp on, and that living room lamp comes on, she doesn't have to walk over to do it. She also, there's a, there's a skill, which is what we call the, the apps that work with Google, uh, with uh, Amazon, it's called Call My Buddy, and so she could say, if she fell, she could say, Alexa, I'm sorry, ask my buddy to call everyone. And then you can put five names on for free. It would call them, text them, and send them an email all at the same time. So that one's pretty cool. I put that one in place for times when I know that my family's not around to help her, and she's got that, and I've got neighbors hooked up on the list to know to come and help her when that happens. That's pretty cool. Uh, similar, just to point out to you, if you buy the newer version of the Apple Watch, you may have seen ads for this, it'll detect a fall. And so that actually happened the other last fall. My mother-in-law tripped in the house and fell, and immediately my wife got a phone call saying, you have to set that up on the, on the watch, but you're, that said, that just said, G's calling her, we know that's a fall, go, go help her out. 
If you want to talk about these more, we can. Um, you need to have a little bit of patience and you really need to think about what you want, but the stuff isn't that bad to use. It's, it's really not too bad. And, uh, oh, there it is, ask my buddy. I was just telling you about it. And communication devices exist. I was talking about that. And uh, there, I'll take a question. Yep. yep. Okay, hi. Um, is it better to have a computer or an iPad? Yes. Yes and yes. Both. The question was, is it better to have a computer and an iPad? It's what works best for you. I, I, I really, I would look at it more from a perspective of what are the tasks I need to do and which one works best for me, or this is the easiest one for me to use and we'll make it work because both can do all the same things. You know, my students all have iPads at Maryville. We give them to them. But when they write their papers, they prefer their computers because of the full-size keyboard. Mm -hmm. But some write their papers on the iPad. Okay, well, with both of them, I have trouble, like, I touch the key and there's not a letter there or different letters come up or nothing comes up. Do you have any suggestions? I'd have to look more closely at your individual situation, but I, I think you think about it this way, is that with a computer, we're using a, key, a keyboard for sure. With, a, with an iPad, we might be using the on-screen one or we could use an external keyboard. And then we start looking at the problem from there. So, and on. So I don't have a solid answer. I really, I really, I'd want to, I'd have to look at it with you it. And, and really see more about where the issue is. Okay. If it's about, though, if it's about hitting the right key, wherever we can get the bigger, the biggest keys on the keyboard typically is a good place to start. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to end the session. Mm -hmm.